welcome everybody to the next uh, colloquium. Um, this week we're going to be continuing on the theme of black holes and galaxies. This time, moving on to this very fundamental question of the influence of so-called active galactic nuclei, that means accreting supermassive black holes, on the growth of stellar mass in galaxies. And um, it's a very great pleasure to, to welcome today's speaker, Dominika Weilizalak, who I think it's true to say has been at the very forefront of some of the most comprehensive recent observational investigations of that question. And um, it's also very timely to welcome Dominika here because she's just started a new Emmy Nota group at the Astronomicus Reckon Institute at the University of Heidelberg. So I'm sure that we'll hear some of the plans uh, for that group also in this colloquium. Um, prior to coming to Heidelberg, I should say return to Heidelberg because Dominika actually did her bachelor's studies in physics here. Um, Dominika did her PhD research from 2011 to 2014 in uh, Carlos de Broeg's group at the European Southern Observatory um, within the Garking Impress. So uh, we're glad to won you over from, from the Garking Impress. And during that time, she was also in JPL in um, Pasadena, and that enabled her to put together some of the first um, comprehensive data sets of AGNs covering the whole of the infrared from which she could disentangle the emissions from the AGN and those galaxy. And I think that was a fundamental step forward at that time. So after the PhD, Dominica moved to Johns Hopkins University where she worked as a postdoctoral fellow until 2017 with Nadia Zakamska. And this added the further dimension of kinematics of outflows from AGN, which we're, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot about today as probed by optical spectroscopy. Um, and also I, I note working in, in, within the team of SDSS for Manga at that time. And then um, from 2017 to 2020, um, Dominica returned to Garking as an ESO fellow, combining all these strands together, also in combination with big aperture spectroscopic studies. And so now we're very, very happy to welcome you back here, Dominica, from these extensive travels and investigations. And we look forward to hearing about your work now. And as I said, the plans for the future in your new group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, for this very nice introduction. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, yeah, so thank you again for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm very excited to be here today. The um, talk that I'll be giving today focuses on AGN feedback signatures from small to large scales across cosmic time. And I will be mostly talking about projects that are currently being carried out in the newly established research group Galena, which is short for Galaxy Evolution and AGN. Um, that started its work in September last year at um, the Astronomisches Rechen-Institute here at the university. So before I dive right into the topic, let me give you a brief um, scientific background and motivation of why our group is conducting um, the kind of research that it does. Starting with um, one of the favorite, my favorite images of the night sky, the Hubble Deep Field, which um, shows us thousands and thousands of galaxies in a tiny patch of the night sky. And we know today that most of these galaxies host supermassive black holes in their centers. Sometimes um, these supermassive black holes, as um, Richard already mentioned, um, go through active phases during which they actively create matter, during which they actively grow. And this is when we call um, these objects active galactic nuclei or AGN. How this um, accreting phase of a supermassive black hole may look like is shown in the fol following visualization where we zoom into an elliptical galaxy, um, move past the stars right into the center of the galaxy where we find a supermassive black hole that is surrounded by an accretion disk of material that is slowly but steadily being accreted by the supermassive black hole, making it grow in size and mass. So this accretion disk here is depicted to be very bright. Um, and this is for a good reason, because accretion is a process during which 
a lot of energy gets released. It's a very energetic process. And sometimes particles are also being found probably along magnetic field lines um, uh, here, basically perpendicular to the system. And in some AGN, you can observe these plasma jets or radio jets um, coming out of the system and sometimes on very, very large scales. Um, so like I said, um, AGN, the AGN phase of a supermassive black hole is a very energetic one. And even though the supermassive black hole is very small in comparison to the host galaxy that it resides in, a factor of about 10 orders of magnitudes different in size, similar as if you would compare the size of the penny to the size of the moon, it can have an enormous impact on the evolution of the host galaxy. And this is because this accretion energy, the energy that gets released by the black hole, um, can by a large factor exceed the binding energy of the galaxy itself, such that even if just a tiny fraction of that energy manages to couple to the gas, it can significantly affect the evolution and um, yeah, the evolution of the host galaxy. So the, the term AGN feedback, that is a pretty big, big buzzword these days, really only describes um, the fact that the kinetic and radiative output from AGN can affect the gas properties of the host galaxies from very small scales to intermediate out to very, very large scales. So some of the, historically, some of the very first observation evidence um, that originally led to the idea that, that AGN feedback is important in galaxy evolution um, was found when it was seen that the masses of black holes tightly correlates with the uh, masses of their central galaxy bulges. Um, so this is known as the uh, well-known M-sigma relation that, um, well, already 20 years ago or so showed that probably supermassive black holes and galaxies somehow grow together, evolve together, and affect each other's um, evolution. But also in simulations, it has been shown that some sort of AGN feedback is needed to make the simulations actually work. Um, so you need this additional heating source to, for example, um, solve the overcooling problem that cosmological simulations used to have. Um, so what I'm showing here on this plot is the stellar mass to halo mass ratio as a function of halo mass. What is observed in the local universe is um, shown in the blue shaded region. And if you don't implement AGN feedback into your simulations, you end up with curves that look like the gray or the purple curve. So producing way too many massive galaxies at the high mass end in terms of their stellar masses. But by implementing this additional heating source, AGN feedback into the simulations, you then end up with models that look like the, the black curves, for example, that reproduce the observations pretty, pretty well. Um, so we know AGN feedback is an important component in galaxy evolution, and that really has been realized in the past two decades or so. And you can see that since the beginning of the 2000s, the number of papers that mention in, in a way active galactic nuclei outflows or feedback in their abstract or, um, or, or title has increased by a large factor in the last 20 years. So it's really a hot topic and this is for a good reason um, because AGN feedback is probably a very important component in galaxy evolution. Um, but what is really the observation evidence? So when you start to work in the field of AGN, um, maybe also as a student, you are being bombarded with a zoo of acronyms and um, specific terms. Um, so we AGN people, we throw around terms like quasars, hot dogs, blazars, liners, seafirds. Um, so this is all quite confusing when you start to work in the field. Um, so sometimes it may look, it may feel like your, your brain may, may explode from all these acronyms. Um, but really it's not that difficult. Most of these um, terms have grown historically just because people have looked in a certain wavelength regime, observed a certain peculiarity in that wavelength regime and named that population um, with a specific term. Um, but really most of um, the, the differences and similarities between the different AGN types can be attributed to the fact that AGN are sources of both particles and photons. Um, so some AGN are radiatively um, inefficient, um, meaning that the radiative output is difficult to see. 
Um, but then in some of these sources, the, the, uh, the particle output is, uh, is very dominant. So they would have these powerful radio jets that you can observe. In some AGN, um, they are very radiatively efficient, um, but you don't see the radio jets so well. So you end up with phenomena that are all AGN, but can look quite different when you observe them. So on the one extreme, you have these typical blue quasars that are so radiatively efficient that they completely sometimes outshine their host galaxies. Um, and in these other cases, you have sources where you um, see very little of the radiative output of the AGN in the optical wavelength regime, but you do see these powerful jets um, uh, being, being ejected by the system. And then, of course, this parameter space is filled by a lot of uh, intermediate types of AGN. Interestingly as well um, is that there are different AGN feedback modes that are also associated with the, with the two extreme ends of this parameter space. So on the one hand, we observe um, what people call radio mode um, type of feedback, where winds or jets um, slam into the ISM and dump a lot of kinetic energy into the system, heat the atmosphere, induce turbulence, and um, prevent star formation, can prevent star formation from happening. However, this is probably not the kind of transformative feedback that really affects how a galaxy would evolve um, further and is not very transformative. Um, on the other hand, we have this wind type of feedback or quasar mode um, type of feedback um, in radiatively efficient AGN, um, where we observe um, high velocity, large scale winds and outflows that propagate through the galaxy, displace the gas, um, sometimes can push gas outside of the galaxy, really significantly impacting how a galaxy would evolve in, in the future. Um, so this, this type of feedback is also sometimes called quasar mode, wind mode, or radiative mode, of um, radiative mode feedback. And in my talk, I will be actually mostly focusing on the wind mode type of feedback sources. So I, I'm not, I will not be talking too much about radio mode feedback sources. And as you may imagine, an AGN can affect galaxies on many different scales, of course, very close to the galaxy nucleus on ISM scales, kiloparsec scales by shocking the ISM um, by inducing these galaxy wide multiphase outflows, but also on much larger scales on CGM, IGM and ICM scales even and sometimes powerful jets um, are observed to be of that extent where you can see the effect of AGN on a much, much larger scales. And in addition uh, to, to this um, multi-scale phenomenon of AGN, um, AGN are also with AGN feedback signatures are also a function of many other parameters such as redshift, AGN luminosity and environment, host galaxy properties, black hole parameters, accretion rate. So it's really a, a multi-parameter um, yeah, problem or aspect that we're that we're dealing with here. Um, so, because the topic is so complex, um, that means that we're still working on answering a lot of different questions. Um, some of them actually seem to be quite trivial, such as questions of how ubiquitous are AGN-driven winds or how AGN-driven feedback signatures in general, how are the different gas phases connected, how is AGN feedback dependent on host galaxy properties, and um, a particular interesting question when it comes to galaxy evolution is um, the question whether star formation is suppressed or enhanced and if yes, when, how, and how much. And to answer many of these questions, we really need spatially resolved observations to look in detail at how AGN feedback processes relate to the different parameters of the host galaxies. So what do I mean by we need spatially resolved observations? Um, so a brief, um, intro to the observation technique that is um, used in a lot of the work that I will be presenting. Um, so in a lot of the, the observations that I'm conducting, we're using integral field unit spectroscopic observations. That means that we're not only observing one spectrum, a galaxy with one spectrum, or we're taking just one image of a galaxy, 
um, but we're actually this technique allows us to obtain a spectrum in every single pixel um, across the field of view of that observation. So allowing us to really spatially resolve AGN and host galaxy parameters in a lot of detail together. And nowadays, most of the largest ground-based telescopes are equipped um, with IFU spectrometers, um, but also future facilities will be equipped with IFU instruments, such as um, the NIRSPEC and MIRI instruments on the JWST, um, but also Harmony as the instrument, um, the IFU instrument that will go on the, um, the extremely large telescope, which will be a very powerful instrument. Um, in terms of the observation signatures that um, we're kind of looking for um, when, we, when we search for AGN feedback signatures or so winds and outflows are um, in general asymmetric blue shifted emission line components. In particular, a lot of works, um, not just in our group, but also in other group, um, they use the O3 emission line at 5007 angstrom um, which is a bright emission line in the optical and that is used as um, a common tracer for, I, for the ionized gas phase um, that traces gas on, on fairly large distances. So you can look at what the gas, gas at large distances does. And these blue shifted component that you sometimes observe in, in AGN are really the smoking gun for having found an outflow that depending on the velocity and the velocity shift may or may not be driven by the AGN. And um, so because we're working with a lot of IFU observations, we can do these kind of measurements of the spectra in every single pixel across the observation, leaving, leading to these, um, uh, well, IFU maps where you can actually spatially map the velocity width, for example, of the line or the line of sight velocity. So a lot of the measurements that I'll be presenting will be about the velocity dispersion of the line width that we measure of a specific emission line or the velocity shift with respect um, to the systemic velocity, which tells us something about how the gas is moving um, with respect um, to us. Um, so my talk is broadly structured into, into three parts. Um, the first part will be focusing on galaxies uh, at, uh, in the local universe on very small scales from about 0.5 to 8 kiloparsec. Part two will focus on more high redshift galaxies at a near cosmic noon, um, probing scales from 1 to 25 kiloparsecs. And then the third part of my talk will focus on more high redshift sources um, probing scales um, a few, of a few tens to hundreds of kiloparsec sizes. So starting with um, the first part of my talk, um, this part is focusing on galaxies that have been observed within the Manga survey. Um, Richard mentioned it in, in his introduction, Manga is um, part of the SDSS4 survey as a large IFU survey that has observed um, 10,000 galaxies. All right, so I was, I was talking about manga and about um, finding and identifying the AGN among those 10,000 galaxies that, uh, that have been observed. And you can do that in many different ways, but we decided to develop an IFU-based um, AGN selection algorithm that leverages this additional parameter space that um, the IFU observations offer us. And we do this mostly based on spatially resolved BPT diagnostics, I'm not going into a lot of detail here. You can ask me more if, if you want to know about this um, selection algorithm. I just want to highlight that we are indeed identifying and finding AGN that would have been previously been missed in, um, in prior SDSS single, uh, single fiber surveys. And we have a program um, going on that follows up some of these sources using um, Chandra. And we do indeed find evidence that most of these sources that we had flagged as AGN candidates are indeed hosting AGN, even though they might have been missed in previous optical selections. So that's quite exciting. So having found those AGN, we now want to look for the signatures, the AGN feedback signatures inside those sources. Um, and again, we're focusing here on the O3 emission line and um, fitting every single spexel in all galaxies um, in, in, across all spexels, allowing for broad secondary components to be accounted for. So um, an example for one of those spectra is shown here. 
So this analysis was um, originally done a couple of years ago, but is now actually being uh, redone very thoroughly by a master student, Marco Alban, who's working in our group, who is not only doing a very thorough fitting analysis, but is also now actively looking at how feedback signatures um, differ or um, are similar to each other in different AGN types. So this is quite an exciting project. Um, from the prior work, we find that um, from the much smaller sample, that the velocity widths that we measure in the AGN, so parameterized here by this W80 parameter, um, a scooter was much high velocities compared to um, what we see in the non-AGN. So we do see indeed clear signatures for winds and outflows in these sources, even at low redshift and low luminosity AGN. And having access to the full um, 2D information, we can also look at how these outflows um, well, spatially, uh, spatially um, change as a function of radius. Um, so on this plot, you can see the W80 parameters, the velocity width of the O3 line as a function of radius for the more luminous AGN in the sample for the less luminous AGN in the sample in dashed red and the non-AGN shown in green. We do see a clear correlation between AGN luminosity and wind extent. Um, so this correlation is not necessarily new, but it's interesting that it also holds true for these relatively low luminosity AGN. However, when we compute the kinetic coupling efficiencies, so the amount of energy that is um, in the outflow compared to the bolometric output of the, of the AGN, those are very, very small, indicating that probably these winds don't actually do much to their host galaxies. However, the caveat here is that we're only probing the ionized gas phase. But AGN driven winds are multi-phase phenomena, and in particular, the molecular gas phase is very important because that is the phase out of which the stars form. So ideally, we want to also investigate how these ionized gas outflows relate to the amount of molecular gas in these galaxies. So this is why we've started um, a large follow-up survey called MASCOT, um, which uses the Arizona Radio Observatory to um, follow up manga galaxies targeting the CO120 emission line. So here you see the galaxies um, from the mass that we observed within mascot in the stellar mass um, star formation rate plane. So we're primarily looking at galaxies um, above and on, and now we're also starting with galaxies below the main sequence. Um, these are examples of um, some of our CO profiles that we measure for these galaxies. So for I don't have the exact number, but I'd say 95% we get really nice clear detections of the CO luminosity or the, the CO emission line, allowing us to compute a CO luminosity and inferring um, the molecular gas mass in these galaxies. Um, and then you can basically reproduce the plot that I just showed, um, showing the galaxies in the stellar mass star formation rate plane, but now color coded by the molecular gas mass fraction in the upper panel and the star formation efficiency in the lower panel. And you can see that the both mo that the, the molecular gas mass fraction and the star formation efficiency determine a galaxy's location in, in this plane. And basically from a measurement of the molecular gas mass fraction, you can already tell a lot about how much and if a galaxy is quenched or not and how it relates to the star formation rate main sequence. Um, these plots could have been made without having access to the manga and uh, the manga observations. The strength of the mascot survey is that we're not only looking at uh, well single single measurements for galaxies in terms of the star formation rate or stellar mass, but we can actually look at spatially resolved parameters and how those relate to the molecular gas mass measurements that we conduct. So in this <clears throat> slide, I'm showing you on the y-axis the molecular gas mass fraction as a function of the stellar age of, um, in these, that is measured in these galaxies inferred from the, mascot, uh, the, the manga observations. So a negative slope means that the stellar populations are older in the center of the galaxy compared to its outskirts. And a positive slope means that the stellar populations inside the galaxies are younger in the center compared to the outskirts. And we do observe um, a tentative correlation here between the molecular gas mass fraction and the slope of the stellar age. 
um, potentially being evidence for inside out quenching of these galaxies. Um, as we increase our sample size, we're hoping um, that this correlation may become stronger and that we can infer even, even stronger conclusions from, from these observations. Um, Carolyn Bertimus, who's a postdoc working in our group, is also uh, doing a, um, a very, very thorough full radial analysis of the manga observations by carrying out a very thorough population synthesis modeling um, and relating her measurements with the molecular gas mass measurements from the mascot observations. So this is still very much work in progress, but let me show you one of the plots that, um, that excite us right now. Um, where we show for galaxies above the main sequence um, that their metallicity gradients are flatter for galaxies that have low molecular gas mass fraction compared to galaxies um, with higher molecular gas mass fractions. Um, so this may be a hint that we see in evidence for inside out growth or potentially accretion of metal poor gas at larger radii in those galaxies that show a larger molecular gas mass fraction. And Caroline is also looking um, in particular at how um, the AGN among the mascot galaxies relate and are similar or different to the general um, star forming galaxy population. So this leads me <clears throat> to the first take home message of my talk that we do find evidence for ubiquitous AGN driven outflows in low luminosity, low redshift AGN from Manga. Um, we don't really know yet what the impact of the host galaxies is, but um, the mascot CO follow up uh, may provide additional clues for that question. All right, so moving on to the second part of my talk, um, I'm now talking about galaxies at slightly higher redshift and um, probing larger ang angular scales. And um, the reason why we're moving to higher redshift is, um, is, is quite a fundamental one. If you take a step back and look at how the universe evolved and how galaxies in the universe evolved, um, for example, and you look at the, how the star formation rate density in the universe evolved as a function of redshift, you can see that the star formation rate density in the universe peaked somewhere between redshift one and three. So this is shown here in this plot and um, fitted by this black line. So the black line stays the same, but what we're now looking at is the black hole accretion history as a function of redshift. And you can see that the um, quasar space density or the uh, epoch at which um, AGN were most active actually coincides with the epoch at which galaxies were forming most of their stars. So this is um, dubbed as the epoch of cosmic noon and is really the time in the universe where probably most of the action happened and where um, uh, galaxy evolution processes were most transformative and particular to AGN um, where probably AGN feedback processes were most affecting their host galaxies. And our collaborators and, and, and us, we have recently discovered a, a very interesting population of AGN that we dub extremely red quasars um, exactly at that epoch of cosmic noon that show crazy kinematics in their ionized gas um, profiles. So what you're supposed to see here is the H beta emission line and the O3 doublet, but the kinematics are so crazy that all these three lines are completely blended with one another with velocities of about three to 5,000 kilometers per second. Um, the the ERQs, so the extremely red quasars, are even, even more special um, when you compare them to galaxies with the same, or AGN with the same volumetric luminosity as um, the ERQs. So what I'm showing here is, um, so in this case, it's, it's a W90 parameter. So again, the velocity width of the O3 emission line as a function of the volumetric luminosity of the AGN. And the kinematics for the extremely red quasars are shown here in red. So if you compare them to quasars at similar volumetric luminosity, they show even crazier kinematics than typical blue quasars. Um, suggesting that we may have indeed identified a population of AGN that is tracing this initial blowout phase of quasar feedback in the early universe. 
The caveat here, however, is again that we're only tracing the ionized gas phase um, so far, but we do know that AG, AGN winds are multiphase phenomena. And if you look at this plot, um, so this is a plot where um, data from the literature was compiled, and you look at the uh, basically the parameter space, AGN volumetric luminosity and outflow strength. Um, so blue is molecular outflows, green is ionized outflows. There's basically no, no blue data points in this um, uh, in this box here, showing that we have no clue um, really what the molecular gas phase is doing in those most extreme AGN. And um, part of the reason for this lack of information is, is that crucial traces that probe the multiphase gas move into a regime of the wavelength um, range that is really difficult to access with current instrumentation and from the ground. So they move into the near and mid infrared um, out of reach uh, with current instrumentations. So true multiphase mapping of AGN driven winds has not really been possible in the high range of powerful AGN just yet. So this is why uh, we started um, a, a program um, with the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the program is called Q3D and was accepted as part of the early release science programs, meaning that these data will be among the first ones that will be taken once JWST flies and is calibrated probably about a year from now. Um, and we will be using the NearSpec and NERI IFU modes um, on the JWST to spatially resolve the kinematics of the multiphase wind in three powerful quasars at redshift um, above one and a half. And we're also currently developing a software package that will um, spatially and spectrally subtract the PSF contribution from our observations. And we're also making the software public um, to the, the astronomical community and hoping that not just people working on quasars will be able to use that um, PSF subtraction package. And uh, you're welcome to ask me more questions about this if, if you're interested. Um, just to show you briefly what we'll be doing. So the x-axis shows you the wavelength um, on the, the three different panels. I show you the, the three different sources that we'll observe and the blue and the pink shaded regions um, are the filters and grating settings that we'll be using for the individual sources. Um, so for all the sources um, spanning a metric range between 0.4 and 3, um, we will be observing emission line traces of the ionized gas phase, the molecular gas phase, star formation rate traces, and shock diagnostics, basically all in one, all in one shot, which is, which is quite exciting. Um, I also want to point out that um, since a couple of weeks ago, I'm, I'm a member of the James Webb Space Telescope user committee, and I know that um, some of the Heidelberg community is involved in JWST projects. So if you want to give feedback or have questions, um, uh, please feel free to contact me anytime. So the, the user committee is thought to be a committee um, basically communicating between the James Webb users and the people responsible for the observatory. So that leads me to the second take home message of my talk that dust upskirt quasars are the most likely sites for vigorous AGN feedback at high redshift. And um, the AWST will be an exciting observatory and will resolve multi-phase outflows in high redshift quasars at cosmic noon. So moving on to the third part of my talk, um, we're now moving beyond cosmic noon to redshift range between three and five, um, probing, probing even larger spatial scales. And for this part of the talk, we'll be mostly focusing on a population of AGN that are called high redshift radio loud AGN that have been shown um, to belong to the most massive galaxies in the early universe with stellar masses ranging up to 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 solar masses. And that have been shown to be powerful signposts of large scale structures. Some of them are probably the progenitors of BCGs of brightest cluster galaxies that we observe in the local universe. Um, these uh, high range of radar AGN host powerful AGN. And some of them are powerful, um, or are, are forming stars at very high rates. Um, so these sources are ideal laboratories to study um, the interplay of gas in and outflows, stellar feedback, AGN feedback, 
accretion from the cosmic web all at once um, in some of the most massive galaxies that must have formed quite quickly and early on in the evolution of the universe. So quite an exciting population. Um, utilizing the, um, the, the MUSE instrument, which is an IVU instrument on the Very Large Telescope, the VLT, um, we are now conducting a program um, mapping the rest frame UV spectra of some of these sources. In particular, um, some of the first um, analysis focused on the Lyman alpha emission line. And I'm showing you here an example that was published a couple of years ago from uh, by Joël Vanet, um, mapping basically the Lyman alpha halo around um, a radio galaxy. So this picture may not look like much, but it's actually indeed quite exciting. So the host galaxy is uh, located here where you see the blue cross. Um, the radio jet position are marked in, um, in yellow. And then the Lyman alpha halo extends over scales of 300 kiloparsecs, which is um, quite large. Um, we find in this paper that the emission um, below at less than 100 kiloparsecs is consistent with ADN photoionization, but then the emission at larger scales is consistent actually with shock excitation um, by, from gas being accreted from the cosmic web. So these types of um, sources and these types of observations are really ideal to probe the full feedback loop of um, feeding to and feeding from the CGM. Um, and we now have a sample of eight radio galaxies that have been observed uh, in a similar setting with MUSE that we are currently analyzing. So this shows you the sample that, that we're looking at and the small video shows you um, uh, basically moving through wavelength space um, around the Lyman alpha emission lines. So you see these beautiful Lyman alpha nebulae showing up um, and disappearing as you move across the wavelength, uh, as you move across wavelength space. Um, so the data is extremely rich and complex. So this is why we've started um, with the detailed analysis of the highest redshift source in the sample, um, the source down here for CO411. That shows um, a lemon alpha nebula that is not crazily big with an extent of about 60 kiloparsecs. Um, so this is a narrowband image um, focusing on the lemon alpha emission line. The green small contours here show you the extent of the radio jet. Um, zooming in a little bit more, um, showing you the lemon alpha surface brightness map inferred from the observations where um, the individual spec cells have been binned in, into, um, into spatial bins of different size to allow for um, a uniform signal to noise basically across, um, across the Lemon Alpha Nebula. So again, the green contours show you the, um, the position of the radio, the, the radio contours. Um, so the, the strength of these IV observations is that we not only have uh, the, the 2D spatial information, but in every single of these spatial bins, um, we can look at what the Lyman alpha um, spectrum actually looks like in detail. Um, so looking at the Lyman alpha profile, you can immediately see that it's very, very complex. Um, and in fact, most of the emission is probably absorbed. Um, so we've modeled the um, Lyman alpha emission here using two Gaussian emission line components and then a set of eight abs absorbing, um, well, eight absorbers basically, um, that are modeled through void profiles. And I have to say that um, Uji Wang, who is a PhD student working in our group, has done an amazing job in, um, in, in analyzing this very complex data set and in thoroughly fitting these very complex profile in all, I forget how many those are, 60, 70 bins, um, basically across the field of view, um, which was really not an easy task uh, to, uh, to conduct. And the, the amazing thing about these observations is that we can not only look at what the Lyman, Lyman alpha emission does, but we can look at the dark component, the dark gas that is basically absorbing, responsible for the absorption in the Lyman alpha emission line profile. 
Um, so from the modeling, we can infer column densities of the absorbing gas um, in every single spatial bin. So this is shown here. So this is how the column density of this first dip, this first absorber varies across the field of view with higher column densities in the top and lower column densities in, um, in, in the south. In addition to mapping the column density, you can also look actually at the velocity of this absorbing gas cloud. Um, so this shows you here now the velocity shift of the first absorber that shows a velocity gradient with the blue shifted and the red shifted side um, with its axis actually being coincident with the radio jet axis, which is um, quite surprising and very, very interesting. Um, so Woody didn't just look at the Lyman alpha emission line, but also at other rest frame UV lines, for example, the carbon four, helium two lines, the um, nitrogen five line here, um, very, very complex and, and uh, difficult modeling. But from those inferred line ratios and column density ratios, um, we can actually tell a lot about the conditions of the gas and, and what scenario we might actually be looking at with that first absorber that shows this velocity gradient and column density gradient from the south to the north. Um, so from putting all observations together, we've arrived at the picture where probably this first absorbing cloud represents a, a gaseous shell that has been ejected some time ago by possibly AGN or star formation processes that is now interacting with the radio jet in the south. Um, we see this blue shifted side in the blue in the, in the north, we see, we see this red shifted side. And because we're looking through different um, columns of this shell, um, we're observing this velocity, uh, this column density gradient here as we do in the observations. Um, we also infer that this gas cloud is probably a metal enriched. Um, so meaning that possibly AGN, even at this high redshift, take a very important part in redistributing metals into the ISM and CGM, um, which is very, very, very interesting observations to have conducted. And we're very excited to be moving on to the full sample um, to see um, whether we see similar signatures in the other sources as well. Um, just my last slide, I know I'm, I'm almost um, up with my time. Um, Uji also submitted a JWST Cycle 1 program, um, particularly focusing on, uh, those, on four of those radio galaxies. Uh, the program had the title Zooming into the Monster's Mouth. Um, and with this program, we will be using the NearSpec instrument to map the stellar gas and excitation components of four of those distant radio galaxies and then combining them with the data that we already have at hand, namely, for example, the Symphony data mapping O3 and the MUSE data mapping Lyman alpha and the rest from UV spectra, um, will be very interesting basically to put together a comprehensive picture of the sources at high redshift. So that leads me to the third um, take home message of this talk. MUSE um, really unravels the feeding and feedback from and to the cosmic web and powerful high redshift AGN. We spatially resolve the kinematics of gas and absorbing structures, uh, which suggests a complex interplay in the CGM. Um, and another aspect that we want to investigate in the near future is um, how what the link is to other AGN populations, exotic AGN populations at this redshift. So there are some other groups that are conducting um, similar, similar observations with a slightly different focus and, and our aim here is also to basically put together the results from the literature to understand the importance of AGN and um, the effect even at the epoch before cosmic noon. So um, I leave you with the three take home messages from the three parts of my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. And I'll try to switch on my video again, see if that works. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing kaleidoscope of observational information. Um, it's almost bewildering to, to, to know how to put this together. I think it's fantastic that you can see the um, intergalactic medium. I'm sure there are lots of questions which will arise from various things. So 
if people would like to put their hand up. Um, um, in the meantime, I have a question, actually. You mentioned about accretion rates, but presumably you can only measure accretion rates when the AGN is actually on, so to say. Um, isn't there another factor in this which controls the sort of um, demographics of how much, you know, how fast the black holes grow over cosmic time, which is um, the, the, the duty cycle, you know, what fraction of time are those black holes accreting? And, and is that known? And does that also change with redshift? Can you say something about that? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. And um, as far as I know, there, I mean, the estimates that regard the duty cycles of AGN range from like 10 to 7, 10 to the eight years um, I'm not aware of a thorough study that looked at how this varies or might vary as a function of redshift. That's a very good question. Um, but like the average time scales that, um, that people cite are like 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Now we have a question from Nadine. Hey, Dominika, thanks for this excellent talk. It's really exciting to see your work. Um, I had a question on this a galaxy that Wu Ji was uh, analyzing and the orientation of the radio jet relative to the gas motion. Um, what is the physical picture that you're drawing there? Like, would the gas, uh, if, if the gas was in rotation, the jet is aligned with the rotating gas, or could this also be outflowing gas? This is more the outflowing gas that you see, right? Yeah, so, so the velocity gradient, and I may try to share again, see? The velocity gradient that we observe is, um, is, is actually quite subtle. Um, so if you look at the velocities here, they range from at most minus 40, minus 50, or my, to, to 40 plus 40. Um, kilometers per second. Um, so for a while we were debating whether this is a rotating gas or gas that is basically being uh, dragged along or affected by the radio jet. And um, <clears throat> looking at um, the, the velocities themselves and also looking at um, the other signatures that we see in, in the galaxy, namely, for example, that this gas is, is, is observed on very, very large scales, we actually don't think that this is rotation. Um, so it's probably um, gas that is, that is being affected or interacting with the jet. Um, and what I forgot to say, actually, so we know from the radio observations that the southern jet is the one that is approaching us. Okay. Um, so that makes sense with respect um, to observing the blue shifted site in the south. Hmm. Yeah, and it looks like from the radio lobes that it's pretty... Um pointed i don't know is is this the case or like do you how how do you see the jet inclination it's very difficult to see probably right because yeah. also the the gas velocity is very um subject to uh, the inclination of the gas right yes exactly okay yes yeah, so i don't think that um a proper inclination was inferred for this uh, for, for this galaxy and it's it's quite difficult as you say yeah so what's the redshift again can you remind me um, four and a half okay wow it's amazing to have these kind of data at the Redshift four and a half galaxy. Really exciting. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? We've still got a few minutes. So, um, can I ask another question in the meantime? Um, you were talking about this very luminous red QSO, or, or a bunch of them. Um, uh, what, what's going on there? Is this sort of a massive uh, blast of UV which is interacting with dust, which is pushing things out, and is that same dust keep it, you know causing the red red colours? What what is the physical picture for that source? Yeah, so um, <laughs> they are, they are very interesting sources. Let me go to the slide. I didn't include all the plots that we have for these sources. Um, so we indeed have some IFU observations um, of the O3 line for these sources um, from um, a Gemini NIFS observations. 
but they're only probing the um, highest surface brightness gas, um, which is quite high velocity, but also we don't see actually that those winds are very extended. Um, so the, the, the extent of the wind that we see for now, and JWST might prove us better, is quite compact. Um, and these galaxies are indeed quite dusty. Um, they, we have some X-ray observations of these sources. They show high column densities, um, but they probably not X-ray weak. Um, so they really truly um, high column density sources. And so you, you, so you, you, you mean that you don't see the X-rays because it's just too much column there, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And um, so the, the picture that, that, that we're starting to put together is that those are probably very dust and shrouded galaxies um, at early times where this active um, extreme quasar phase has just started and it's starting to clear out the immediate environment of, um, of the sources. So if you look at the optical spectra, the restroom optical spectra, they actually show a mix of um, type one and type two signatures. Um, so they, they are really possibly sources where you can see the initial blowout of, um, of these dust and shrouded objects. Did you also have uh, dust emission data for that? Um, we don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've applied for some time, yes. All right, okay, thanks. Let's discuss that. Uh, in the in extended discussion, it's really interesting. We have another question from Andrew. Hi, yeah. So nice talk. I, I may have misunderstood uh, the the but the last um, AGN you were showing with the 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 velocity gradient. Why why is it that you don't see, so the model to interpret this is is just with the with the jets? Why don't you see any signatures of um, of a rotation? Well, so the we're seeing that. Um, the gas is, is quite metal enriched. Um, so it's, it's um, super solar probably from the, from, the, um, from the estimates that we can do with the quality of the data. Um, and it's extended on scales of 40 or so kiloparsecs. So it's very difficult to imagine a, um, such a metal enriched uh, rotating structure at redshift of four and a half. So the more likely scenario is that you had um, a starburst and early star formation and AGN activity um, prior to when we to when we are observing this galaxy um, that caused this metal enrichment and is now actually um, basically distributing the gas towards larger scales. Um, so that's that's the basic picture, and it it matches. It, I mean, it, it would just be such a coincidence that the velocity gradient that we observe matches exactly, really, the axis of the radio jet. Um, so the 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 most likely scenario is uh, is that it's it's really interacting um, with the radio jet in in a way. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um... Well, if there are no more questions, I think we'll um, gradually end the main part of the colloquium. Um, I have a couple of announcements. The first is that, as last week, we will have an extended Zoom session, and everybody is very welcome to stay behind, maybe for a more informal discussion with Dominica um, about any topic, uh, scientific or otherwise. Um, and. To make my second announcement, I'd like just to take the screen back. Yeah, and um, yeah. So I, uh, that's just to announce the next next week's talk, which is by Michaela Mappelli. And again, we're going on our, our black hole odyssey, coming down in mass somewhat, but um, uh, nevertheless very interesting. And I'd like to draw attention to the fact that um, uh, Michaela's host will be Ralph Crescent. So. If you want to sort of um, get in contact with uh, Michaela and um, ask any questions in advance or arrange a meeting afterwards, please, please do that. Uh, uh, get in touch with Ralph to do that. So um, I think um, if I just get uh, back to the
um, uh, just to uh, now invite everybody to thank Michaela, sorry, thank Dominica for this amazing tour de force of observational data. I have the impression that you're going to be very, very busy in the next uh, months and years with all this. And, and we look forward to hearing really what, what the final story is going to be. Um, but thank you so much for giving this insight into, into the, uh, what's going on at the moment. And I invite everybody to open up their microphones and their videos to thank um, Dominica for this excellent talk. Thank you.